Yeah. All right, everyone. So sorry for this uh, technical mishap. So we are very happy to have uh, Johan uh, Henriksen from Pisa, who is going to tell us about critical exponents from the Lorentzian inversion formula. OK, thank you very much, Miguel. And uh, I would like to begin by thanking the organizers for giving me the opportunity to speak at this uh, great uh, workshop. It's, it's a great honor. So as the title suggests, I've been invited to give a lecture on the Lorentzian inversion formula and how it can be used to constrain conformal field theories. So in essence, this inversion formula by Simon Carolhuo is in principle a dispersion relation for conformal field theories. And it works in Lorentzian kinematics. So I like to think of it in the following way. So I like to think of it as a way of extracting conformal data. So OP coefficients, scaling dimensions from the correlator, the four point function. And this works through this inversion formula. And this, the way it's constructed is that this inversion formula is sensitive to the certain kinematic limit Z bar goes to one. And this is quantified in the thing called the double discontinuity, which I'm gonna describe later more precisely. So the inversion formula played an important theoretical role in establishing analyticity in spin. So these operators that you find the data for are really operators with spin. So you can have a little spin label here if you want. But uh, today I want to take a little bit more of a practical perspective and I'm simply going to try and use the inversion formula to find uh, conformal data in various uh, settings. So since this is not a talk, but rather a lecture, instead of giving a kind of broad overview, I'm gonna try to be extremely concrete and consider one particular example in, in, in full detail. So the example I have in mind is this well-known class of conformal field theories, which we I want to call lambda phi to the p theory. So p here is an integer greater than or equal to three. And uh, just to, uh, before we get started, just to get everyone on the same page, let me be very clear what I mean by, by this, this theory, this class of theories. So you can consider a Lagrangian density where we have a standard kinetic term, this phi to the p interaction, and then a bunch of, of lower interactions. And then from power counting, you can find the upper critical dimension. And then it's a pretty well-known story that if you work in dimensions less than this upper critical dimension, you can tune these lower couplings and then arrive at an IR fixed point, which is conformal field theory. And of course, if you're an even P, you can impose a Z2 symmetry that automatically kills some of these. But this is a general description. So just um, the familiar examples, some examples of this. So if P equals four, we get the, the standard phi to the four theory, which defines the easing CFT, upper critical dimension four. Then I'm also choosing to include possibilities of odd powers p here, especially since this is in the week of non-unitary CFTs. Uh, so for instance, p equals three gives the Li Yang CFT, upper critical dimension six. You can continue down the list then. So p equals six gives a tricritical easing, etc. And today I'm gonna simplify things even further, and I'm gonna look in the epsilon expansion for each of these theories. So P equals GC minus epsilon for a much, for a very small parameter epsilon. And this is some generalization of the Wilson-Fisher fixed point. The perspective I want to have 
is really to kind of forget about the Lagrangian description and think of this from the perspective of CFT. So really kind of putting a bootstrap perspective on this. So I I'm thinking of the, the principal observables as, as the conformal data. So we have, for instance, scaling dimensions of local primary conformal operators, which delta O, from which you can compute the critical exponents if you want. So the most important operators we're going to consider is, well, it's phi and phi square. And I define the dimension in terms of these two parameters, gamma phi and g here. And they will depend perturbatively in epsilon. And from these, you get some of the standard critical exponents. And in the same way as I did here with phi, I'm going to define the dimension of composite operators with respect to delta phi. So for instance, an important class of operators for us will be these operators of this type. So they're constructed out of two fields and L partial derivatives. So they have spin L. And again, I define the dimensions to be two delta phi plus L. So this is like the engineering dimension plus some anomalous dimension that depends on spin. And these operators are the so-called double twist operators and they will be and very important for us. So the plan for this lecture is that first I'm going to describe, go through some preliminaries, which for many of you will be, of course, familiar. Um, but it's also useful to fix some conventions. Then my goal is to use the inversion formula to compute uh, these anomalous dimensions for the spinning operators, gamma L, to leading order in phi to the four theory. And then we're going to see that there are some consistency conditions once you have computed gamma L that will actually fix the leading order uh, values for these two parameters. And then if I have time at the end, I want to go back to the general case and comment on phi to the four theory for P not equal to four. So without further ado, let's begin. So as the name Lorentzian inversion formula suggests, the venue today will be CFTs in uh, Lorentzian signature. And I'm also specifying here two dimensions greater than two for reasons that will be clear in a while. So Lorentzian signatures uh, facilitates a uh, particular kinematic limit that's not present in say Euclidean signature. And this is the uh, light cone limit. which is defined as uh, the square of a vector goes to zero while keeping at least some of the components x mu finite. And uh, we can look at the OPE in this limit and it takes the form, so phi of x, phi of zero, sum over operators, some of the coefficient, then x to the minus two delta phi plus this label tau called the twist, some x to the mu one, x to the mu l, and then o mu one mu l. So here I'm allowing the operator o to have, have spin l. So what is this label tau? Well, tau is defined as delta minus L for this operator O, and this is a twist. So as you can see in the light cone limit, the OP is controlled by the twist of the operators rather than the scaling dimension. Then I want to consider uh, four point functions And for the four point function, I'm going to use the standard kinematic limit. So let me make this little picture. 
So here we have some space-like direction, time-like direction, and I'm gonna use conformal invariance to put the operators uh, in a space-like configuration. So I'm gonna put x1 here, x3 here at unit distance. Uh, I'm gonna take x4 and send it to infinity. And then I want to restrict to cases where now x2 is free to vary in this die one that given by the light cones of x1 and x3. So let's say x2 here. And for the four point function, there is, uh, you can define the double light cone limit. Where x1, 2 square and x, to three square, both go to zero. Again, keeping their, the components finite. So in this picture, this corresponds to sending x2 up to the top of this, of this uh, diamond. And I want to think of the uh, four point function in terms of the cross ratio. So I define g of z, z bar in the standard way, so x1, 2 squared, x3, 4 squared to the delta phi times the correlated phi of x1. So it's uh, phi of x4. So these cross ratios uh, you can read off in the figure as uh, by these diagonals here. So I'm picking Z to go down like this and Z bar to go up like this. And in Lorentzian signature Z and Z bar are really dependent variables uh, between zero and one. And I'm gonna define the double light cone limit in terms of the cross ratios as Z being the smallest variable then one minus Z bar, both smaller than one. So. This kind of slightly breaks the symmetry towards the left here, if you want, which is needed for some evaluation of, of the conformal blocks. So the four point function has an uh, expansion in terms of conformal blocks. So some of our operators, some OP coefficients. So here by A, I mean really the, the op squared OP coefficients with phi times the conformal blocks G delta L Z Z bar. And we will need to know these conformal blocks in the small Z limit. So let me scroll down a little bit. G delta L. They take the form z to the tau over two. So again, this label twist times the function k with argument delta plus l over two of z bar plus higher orders in z. So z to the tau over two plus one. So what's this function k? Well, k h bar. I'm going to call this argument down here h bar typically of z bar is z bar to the h bar times hypergeometric to f1 of h bar, h bar to h bar, z bar. And note that this leading order in z here is independent of, of space time dimension d. But then if you were to go ahead and compute the subleading orders, they, they do depend on d. So, now I want to be even more concrete and I want to consider the conformal block expansion in a particular example. Uh, so this example is the uh, theory of a generalized free field phi, uh, keeping delta phi generic. So this is the theory of a non-interacting scalar field phi. And it's an important theory in its own. 
uh, in the CFT community, uh, but it will also be the starting point later when we consider the interacting theories. So the four point function here, let's call it GGFF, is like all correlators in the generalized free field theory computed by weak contractions. So we can write down three different ways of connecting the external points here, and then converting this into cross ratios, we get one plus Z Z bar, one minus Z, one minus Z bar, all to the delta phi, plus Z Z bar to the delta phi. And now we can use the conformal blocks as I defined above to write this as a sum of our operators. So the one just goes along and then there is a sum over spin L equals zero to four, etc. Some P coefficients times now conformal blocks with dimension, uh, sorry, I want to write two delta phi plus L and spin L of Z, Z bar. And now all of this is plus higher orders in Z, so order Z to the delta phi plus one. Uh, these OP coefficients A, L, they're known for uh, arbitrary delta phi uh, in closed form. Uh, here I'm only going to need them for delta phi equals one, where they simplify a little bit. And in that case, A, L is two gamma L plus one squared over gamma two L plus one. And this you can find by uh, just expanding the correlator and match the left and the right hand side. So from this OPE, this conformal block decomposition, we can also deduce what the OPE is in this theory. So phi with phi contains first the identity operator. And then there are exactly these operators that I mentioned in the beginning. So phi dl phi plus some other operators that are hidden in these uh, higher orders inside. We're not going to need this, these additional operators. So to be a bit more precise, what do I mean by this? By phi dl phi, I mean, say phi d mu one, d mu l, take this traceless symmetric combination of these derivatives, I think on another phi, and then, moreover, you have to define this up to total derivatives of terms with lower number of fields in order to make them conformal primaries. So these operators are very important and they exist actually also in the interacting theory and they're called the uh, double twist operators. And uh, in the general case, they have this dimension delta L equals two delta phi plus L plus some anomalous dimension gamma L. So to make this very clear, gamma L is zero in the GFF theory. But in the interacting theory, each of these operators can pick up an in principle independent anomalous dimension. So, so far so good, but actually what I've said could equally be done in Euclidean signature. And in fact, you can find these OP coefficients by just expanding this correlator for small z and small z bar. So we're not making use of the double Lycon limit yet. However, it was realized over the last 10 to 15 years that you can actually get more leverage by working in uh, Lorentzian signature. And in particular, in two important papers of uh, 
2012, so times two, and one by Fitzpatrick, Kaplan, Poland, and Simon Stuffin, the other one by Komar Godski and Chibordov. Uh, it was realized that actually these OP coefficients, AL, and the anomalous dimensions are determined by the Z bar goes to one limit. And in principle, by the singular terms in this limit. So if we go back up here, in the previous computation, we needed both of these terms to find the conformal blocks. But now what they found was that these OP coefficients uh, can be uh, extracted just from considering this middle term here, which is the only one that's singular in the Z bar goes to one limit. And uh, after these papers, there were some developments where some quite advanced technology was developed uh, for how to extract the conformal data exactly from this uh, limit of the correlator. Uh, however, these methods were not completely rigorous because in principle, they would only tell you what the asymptotic density for large spin is of, of these functions. But then in many cases, things worked out better than expected. And the asymptotic density turned out to be also valid for finite spin, etc. Uh, so it was a breakthrough then when the Lorentzian inversion formula uh, was formulated by Simon Carantriot. So Lorentzian inversion formula. Um, you want 2017. So not only this inversion formula shows that you can extract this uh, and it works for finite spin, it also shows now an alternative method of, of finding this uh, CFT data. So very schematically, the inversion formula uh, takes the form C of delta L. This is a function and it knows about this conformal data through its poles. So it goes as AL over delta minus delta L. And it's given by a two dimensional integral in the cross ratios times a kernel, times the thing called the double discontinuity of the correlator. So what is now this double discontinuity? So I mentioned it's sensitive to the singularities in the set bar uh, variable. So if you look in the complex set bar plane, actually conformal correlators uh, have a branch cut in general that starts set bar equals to one. And the double discontinuity is defined uh, uh, with respect to this branch cut. So D disk of a function of set bar is defined as the function minus the two possible analytic continuations around here. So F in one direction plus F in the other direction. So we're gonna want to evaluate it for set bar smaller than one. So you just kind of continue around this branch cut. And we're gonna see how it works more precisely in some examples. So this formula is very elegant and versatile. However, it's still a little bit complicated to use still. So it's a two dimensional integral and this kernel is uh, in full form very complicated. So now I'm gonna present to you a simplified version of the inversion formula that will do the job uh, for us. And it will involve only one integration variable with a much simpler kernel. And to do this, we need to assume two things. We need to assume uh, that we're working in perturbation theory. So 
So for us, this will be the range epsilon small. And that we focus on the operators with smallest twists in the theory. And in particular, we're going to focus on these operators, which have dimension 2 delta phi plus L plus some anomalous dimensions. And these are somewhat general, quite a, a simplification that has quite general applications as well. And uh, from this, you can derive something that I call the uh, perturbative inversion formula. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go through the proof uh, of the perturbative inversion formula. There's a link in the notes I uploaded. Uh, so you just have to, to trust me that it follows using these assumptions from the general formula. So the perturbative inversion formula is a two-step procedure, an algorithm. So first, in step one, we want to compute the following. So it's written as T0 in H bar plus a half T1 of H bar log Z plus higher orders. So this is a generating function in log Z bar, no log Z if you want. And it's given by the following one dimensional integral. So it's a constant integral theory to one d z bar or z bar squared. Then this function k uh, of z bar that we saw before in the conformal blocks times the double discontinuity of the correlator z z bar now projected onto the power z to the delta phi. So let me, let me explain again what this does. So it tells you to take the correlator, function of z and z bar, compute the double discontinuity using the definition above, then look at the term proportional to z to the delta phi. And you can do this working in perturbation theory and the only thing that can happen is that when you do this projection, you might produce some log logarithms in set. So if you have no logs, you go through and compute this and you store the result as this T0. Then the term proportional to log Z, you store in this T1, etc. And then of course you should multiply by this constant kappa, which it's just a ratio of gamma functions. So it's gamma of h bar to the four over pi squared, gamma of two h bar, gamma of two h bar minus one. So you just take, have to take this gz z bar and divide it by z to the delta phi and maybe keep the logs. Is this the, the point? Well, in how you do it in practice, it's up to you, but yeah, you can divide by z to the delta phi and then take the zeroth order in the series expansion. Okay. But yeah, since you're working everything at order by order in epsilon, when you do this, you can produce these, these logs. You can okay. actually produce higher logs in the subleading powers in epsilon as well. Okay. So, okay, you compute this thing, the T's. So now how do these relate to the uh, conformal data that we're after, this A L gamma L? They're given by a formula. So this is step two. It says A L gamma L to the K. So you can pick whatever value for K you want. It's given by T K H bar plus a half derivative with respect to h bar of t k plus one plus higher orders. And, and each order in perturbation theory, these, these expansions will, will uh, they will end. So you always have a finite number of terms. And then in the end, you need to put 
h bar equals to delta phi plus L. So I claim this was simpler, but now at this point you might be a bit confused. So don't worry, and hopefully it will be more clear when I provide a very explicit example right now. So the example is just what we write, what we just saw before. So I'm gonna consider the GFF theory and I'm gonna look at the limit of the phi goes to one. Actually, it's worth keeping the, the phi general for a while and use it as a regulator in the expressions. So first thing to do is to look at the double discontinuity of the correlator. So the correlator is one plus Z, Z bar over one minus Z, one minus Z bar to the delta phi plus Z, Z bar to the delta phi. And then project onto Z to the delta phi. So as I told you, the double discontinuity is only sensitive to the terms that have a branch cut as Z bar goes to one. So only this middle term will survive. And then when you take the term proportional to Z to the delta phi, the Z dependence vanishes. So in the next step, we consider the disk of Z bar over one minus Z bar to the delta phi. Now, to compute the double discontinuity, you can use the definition I described above. And in practice, to do this, you want to raise these one minus z bar into the exponent, so the logs are visible. And then you take log and replace it by, you know, plus minus two pi i. And if you work this out, what happens is that you get an extra factor in front, the two sine square pi delta phi times what you started with. Now notice that this has produced no log sets for us now. So this will only give rise to T zero and none of the other higher parts in the generating function. So to finish this step one, we compute T zero, which is now say limit delta phi goes to one, two sine square pi delta phi times the integral. So kappa integral zero to one, the z bar over z bar squared, k h bar of z bar times z bar over one minus z bar to the delta phi. And this integral with the definition of k, <laughs> you can go ahead and compute, say in Mathematica, if you want, and then taking the limit, what you get is two gamma of h bar squared divided by gamma of two h bar minus one. So that finishes step one. And now step two is simple. It tells us that AL is just equal to T zero evaluated at h bar equals delta phi plus L. So L plus one. And this gives two gamma of L plus one squared over gamma of two L plus one. So we have exactly reproduced what we got before from the conformal block decomposition, but now you saw that we did it only using what was here in the middle term. So perhaps I should stop here and ask if there are any questions at this point. Maybe, maybe I can ask a, 
somewhat technical question. I mean, when you yeah. started off with the original inversion formula, I think uh, it should already be well defined for for all delta phi, right? Because uh, singularities arise uh, if we try to extract the data for for low spin and critical spin, but otherwise these integrals should always converge. But now in your expression, uh, this integral will diverge when z bar goes to one, right? Depending yeah. Okay. There are two. So. There are two things uh, things uh, in today. So yeah, I had a little bit hard to hear the question, but I think I did it. The question is, aren't there issues with convergence? For instance, if you just have delta phi to one here, this integral would diverge. Uh, there's two replies to this. One is that you have to do some analytic continuation, I think, in order to make sense of this integral at all. But the more practical issue is now why doesn't this diverge? And the, the, the true thing is if you put delta phi to one here from the beginning, it does diverge. But in the same time, this extra sine square factor here goes to zero. So if you keep delta phi generic and take the limit at the end, you get the finite result. What is the kernel here? K of H. Oh, K is this uh, thing in the conformal blocks. Uh -huh. So this okay, thanks. hypergeometric. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can also, okay. instead of trusting Mathematica to do the integral, you can replace this by an integral representation first. So you have two, two integrals and they're doing them in the opposite order. But the, yeah, it's possible to work this out for generic delta phi. I guess you, you, I mean, you can always get the result by analytic continuation, of course, but um, I, I guess it, it must come from when you start off with the Euclidean your inversion formula, probably you need to subtract these uh, low lying contributions first. Because this comes from the double discontinuity of the identity. So, uh, Anyway, it's okay. It's, it's it's fine. I think I understand. So thanks. You told at the very beginning that uh, the lower bound for d is two. It is okay for um, phi two of the fourth theory. And what about the others? It's really always two. So okay, I made uh, this statement here. You're referring to yes. Okay, I, I don't really, maybe there are subtle things exactly where, where you can define these other theories, but the higher theories should connect to the, the higher theories for even P should connect to the unitary minimal models. So it should work down to two. The odd powers, okay, the Li Yang, you should also be able to continue down to two dimensions. Yeah. The, the important part for this is that I work in an epsilon expansion near the upper critical dimension. Yes, thanks. Okay, so you saw one, one quick computation now, but now you might be worried actually, what makes this bootstrap? After all, we just had a complicated way of finding a result we already knew. And the way I'm gonna use this and turn it into a bootstrap problem is to use the crossing equation. And in particular, I'm gonna use the crossing equation for the first step to try and evaluate the double discontinuity of the correlator. So inside here, I'm just gonna replace the correlator by the crossed version. So there is this standard factor from crossing. Uh, and then times the sum over operators now in the cross channel of P. So let's call them O prime, A O prime, G delta prime, L prime. And then in the common block, I need to replace the cross ratio, so one minus z bar, one minus z. And by the way, if you remember the, the scaling of these conformal blocks, 
is now go as one minus a bar to the tau prime over two. So this gives an idea of the general strategy. <laughs> so the plan is to consider various operators O prime that can appear in the cross channel of the E and then kind of invert them. That is to take them uh, through this perturbative inversion formula. So some operators that I can consider in the cross channel could be O prime equals the identity. In this case, uh, this whole part of the OP coefficient in form of block just reduces to one. And focusing on the Z bar dependence, I will get exactly this power Z bar with one minus Z bar to the delta phi. And we have just seen that this gives these OP coefficients of the generalized free field. And this has an important implication since the identity operator exists in any CFT, it means that actually if a CFT contains an operator phi, it also contains, must contain this operator phi d to dl phi. Of course, they could pick up an anomalous dimensions, but they must be there. And this statement now only holds in d strictly greater than two. And the reason for this is that if we're in two dimensions, there could be other operators with uh, twist zero. So this thing here would, would not contribute anything more to the set bar goes to one limit. And in principle, these other operators could cancel the, the contribution from the identity operator. If you're in a unitary theory in D greater than two, all the other operators will have a non-zero twist and their contribution could never cancel, at least for large enough spin, the contribution from the identity. So these double twist operators are kind of generic in a CFT in higher dimensions. I, I'm sorry, Jochen. So you said that if we are in a unitary theory, then those extra operators, they don't cancel. And so it means that in the unitary theory, this double twist family should still exist. I, I'm a bit confused. Yeah, in a unitary theory, in D greater than two. In D equal to. In D equal to. In, yeah, oh, in, in D equals two, the proof fails. And this implication is no longer true. But I, I'm just confused because you said if you're in a unitary theory, suppose that there are other operators of twist zero. Yeah, so they are there, but they cannot cancel the unit operator because they will all contribute with positive coefficients. So can't, what, so what, if you're in what, a why would this be wrong to conclude that this double twist should still exist even though it may have different coefficients? No, sorry, in a unitary theory above two dimensions. No, in two dimensions. I, I, my confusion is in two dimensions. Oh, in two dimensions, we can't say anything. But that's my confusion because it seems to me that if I push your logic and mm -hmm. say, look, there may be other operators, but they cannot cancel the unit operator. They may add some more stuff, but they cannot cancel. So no, this there might be other operators exist. with twist zero. Yeah. And they could then cancel the unit operator. Even in the unitary theory. Even in a unitary theory in two dimensions, yeah. But how can they cancel if they all contribute with positive coefficients? Oh, some can contribute with a minus sign. Okay. The, the, this, this block part here can produce some minus signs. Even if the OP coefficients are positive, these blocks here and taking it through the inversion formula, I don't know exactly where the minus signs appear, but... but... Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks. I, 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 this helps. Yeah, so the positivity actually plays a very, very small role in this. No role at all, as far as I can see, at least in the current discussion. In, the, in, that, in that case, it's also simple because in the S channel, I mean, there isn't, it's not just the identity that dominates. Many, I mean, lots of operators contribute at least zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah they contribute, the but. Side. They contribute, but I was thinking that if they all contribute this positive sign, that this would imply that this double twist should still exist. But as Johan explained, they actually don't contribute with the same sign. Yeah. 
So yeah, say unitary d greater than two, these operators must exist, at least for large enough spin. So let's consider what uh, actually what happens if, if we now put these operators in the cross channel. So O prime equals phi dl phi. So recall now these operators have twist to delta phi plus say some anomalous dimension. And let's focus on the z bar goes to one limit. So we have this contribution here and this thing here. So what you get is z bar the one minus z bar to the delta phi times one minus z bar to the tau over two. So to the delta phi plus gamma L over two. And then you can expand this working in perturbation theory, say, so that you guarantee that these anomalous dimensions are small. In the z bar goes to one limit, this becomes one, well, all multiplied by z to the delta phi, but that is just one to leading order, plus gamma L over two log one minus z bar, plus the next order gamma L squared over eight, log square one minus z bar, Etc. And now something quite remarkable happens because we're meant to evaluate this inside the double discontinuity. So if you look at these first two terms, actually they have vanishing double discontinuity. And only the, the third term here has a non zero double discontinuity. Actually, from the definition, you can work out is equal to four pi squared. So this means for us that uh, the contribution from phi dl phi is delayed. And by delayed, I mean, if you work in perturbation theory, you don't need to consider them at leading order. It's only at an order proportional to their anomalous dimension square that you start to worry about it. So finally, we're ready to formulate the uh, strategy for the phi to the four theory. So the plan will be as follows. It will be to invert the O prime equals identity. And then it turns out that the only other operator you need to consider to leading order is this phi square operator. I can come back to that later why we don't need to worry about the other ones. And we're gonna now take D and gamma phi as free parameters. Oh, parameters. And we hope that we can fix them later. So recall delta phi is d minus two over two plus gamma phi, delta phi square is two delta phi plus d by our definitions. So let's execute the strategy. Well, first again, O prime equals identity just gives this contribution that we have just seen, which only contributes to T zero and gives the leading order of P coefficients. So let's consider this done. And then move to O prime equals phi squared. And for this operator, I'm gonna borrow what we just worked out for other operators by linear in phi. So we need to consider now D disk Z, Z bar over one minus Z to the delta phi. A, which uh, I'm just calling this OP coefficients phi, phi, phi squared squared, which actually equal to two at leading order. Uh, then we get this G square over eight 
log square one minus z bar. And then there is an additional part coming from the rest of the conformal block that I kind of ignored above. And it's log z bar minus log z over z bar. And then we're supposed to project onto z to the delta phi. I, I'm sorry, where does this second last term come from? I am a bit confused. Uh, this log? Le log log z bar minus log z. Where does it come from? Oh, it's from the rest of the conformal block. So I told you here, this is just the leading scaling of the conformal block. Ah, I see, I see, okay. But there yeah. is there are other parts of it. And yeah. actually to this leading order, you can even evaluate the conformal blocks in four dimensions. Okay because you, you kind of used all your powers of epsilon already in G squared. Okay, thanks. So from the step one of the procedure, now this, we have a log Z, so we have T1, and it's actually gonna be two times the coefficient of Z to the delta phi log Z. So T1, would be two kappa integral zero to one t z bar over z bar squared k h bar of z bar is a g square over eight. Then log square just gives the double discontinuity for pi square. And then minus one from here. And if you put delta phi to one, the z bar cancels to leading order. And computing this integral, you get two gamma of h bar squared over gamma of two h bar minus one, same as we had before, times minus a g square over eight j square. So what, now what is this j square? j square is this comp uh, combination delta plus sorry, j squared, delta plus L over two, delta plus L minus two over two. And it's called the conformal spin. So the specialist will recognize this as the eigenvalue of the Casimir of the light cone. Don't worry about it. You can just use this definition. And we can find gamma L as T one over T zero is minus A g squared. Oh, sorry, eight, this should be two here. Two j squared. Sorry about that. Uh, so to leading order, we get delta L equals two delta phi plus L minus the thing here. So if we put A equals two, it's g squared over L, L plus one to leading order. Okay, this is great, but it still depends on our two free parameters, G explicitly here, and then also gamma phi inside delta phi here. But remarkably, there are now two consistency conditions we can use to fix these free parameters. So at spin two, the operator is actually nothing else than the stress tensor, which means that the dimension must be equal to D, which is four minus epsilon. And putting uh, spin to two in this formula and solving for gamma phi, you get gamma phi equals G square over 12. So this is quite straightforward. Now it turns out that there is an additional constraint and this came as a little bit of a surprise to us. This additional constraint happens to spin zero. And in principle, the Lorentzian inversion formula is only guaranteed, it's only supposed to work for operators with spin. So nevertheless, we, we try different things and it turns out that we could actually do something also at spin zero. So recall, we have delta phi square equals two delta phi plus G and to leading order, this is uh, two minus epsilon plus G. 
now it looks like I can't just put spin zero in this formula, but actually we should remember that it secretly comes from this conformal spin. So if you go ahead and plug in the definitions, you get, uh, we want to look for delta zero equals delta phi squared. So two delta phi minus g squared over two minus epsilon plus g over two minus epsilon plus g over two. This was the conformal spin equals to delta phi plus g. And you can cancel some things. Uh, you can multiply this thing up to the right hand side. This thing is just one to leading order and reshuffle and you get the equation g times 3g minus epsilon equals zero. So this has two solutions. One, just the free theory. G equals zero. And the other is G equals epsilon over three. So if we proceed with this non-trivial theory, we get non-trivial solution, we get delta phi squared equals two delta phi plus epsilon over three and delta phi equals d minus two over two plus epsilon square over 108. And those of you who are familiar with the epsilon expansion will recognize these are exactly the leading order results for the phi four theory. So they're the same as you get when you compute diagrams. So for instance, for, for delta phi, you need to compute this sunset diagram. Okay, now I have uh, four minutes left, maybe, because I started a bit late. So let me just say a few quick things now about lambda phi to the p theory in dc minus epsilon. So the story is quite similar, so we can proceed quite quickly. Now we're going to need to consider the OPE phi with phi which contains identity plus, again, double twist operators. It's gonna be important the operator phi to the P minus two and then plus other operators. So why this operator? Well, if you make some kind of diagram here, you see that in a four point function, you get this kind of phi to the P minus two moving through the four-point function. So it's gonna contribute to the correlator at order lambda square. The strategy will be to invert O prime equals identity. And O prime is exactly this operator phi to the P minus two. Again, the double twist operators are suppressed to leading order. Three parameters, will be gamma phi, and it will be the OP coefficient of this guy. So phi, phi, phi to the P minus two squared, which we can call uh, lambda square alpha. So just uh, proceeding quickly to the results. If you do this, you get delta L is two delta phi plus L minus dc minus four squared lambda square alpha over two j squared. Now, again, there is a constraint from spin two, the stress tensor, which fixes, if you want, you can fix alpha in terms of, of gamma phi. So this fixes lambda square alpha equals dc dc plus two dc minus four squared times gamma phi. And with this in hand, you can, you have determined all the data in terms of just one parameter gamma phi. And you can put spin zero and you get dimension of phi square. So again, it works as spin zero, we don't quite know why, 
but you get the relation between gamma phi and gamma phi squared, which is exactly the same relation as known in the literature for both even and odd p in phi to the p theories, p not equal to four. Because otherwise you have a problem with this denominator here. So it turns out that you can do even better in the case of phi to the three. So phi cube theory. So what you have there, you have that the phi is two minus epsilon over two plus gamma phi. Delta zero, if you just put zero in, in what you got up here, it's gonna be four minus epsilon plus two gamma phi minus 12 gamma phi. And then it was observed by Vasco Gonzalez in 2018, that there's actually an interesting shadow relation now that fixes delta phi plus delta zero equal to D. So if you trust this and plug these things in, you're gonna, so you can solve for gamma phi and the solution you can check is actually exactly minus one over 80 times epsilon, which again for the experts agrees precisely with the known value in this Li Yang uh, CFT in six minus epsilon dimensions. So with this being said, let me quickly summarize with an upgraded version of what I wrote had written in the very beginning. So we want to compute conformal data, particularly of, of spinning operators. And we do it from the inversion formula. And it depends on the double discontinuity correlator. Now we have found a strategy for evaluating the double discontinuity, namely as a sum over operators in the cross channel. And uh, the second part here describes uh, as a way of, of thinking what determines the contribution from a particular operator. So it's proportional to its OPE coefficient, and then it has this additional factor sine square, which depends on the difference between the twist of the O prime and two delta phi. So this is double zeros exactly for the double twist operators and another important class of operators. So in, in, uh, in the case we saw, we were very lucky and thanks to these factors to leading order in epsilon, order epsilon square, we only needed to consider identity and the phi square operator. And you can continue this to higher orders in epsilon for the phi four theory. At order epsilon cubed, it's the same operators that contribute. Order epsilon to the four, you then need finally these double twist operators kind of feedback again. And you also get some more exotic operators living at higher twist that you need to take care of. You can extend this to phi four theories with global symmetry. Today I was only computing really the anomalous dimensions, but you can find corrections to the OP coefficients, which give you corrections to the central charges. Then the framework also applies in, in other cases. So maybe most interest for this workshop is the one over N expansion for OM, or as Andy mentioned in his talk last week, we also worked out the one over M expansion for this more exotic symmetry group. So what I said today is, is kind of one direction you can do and to work in perturbation theory. There's another important direction which is very nice is to use the inversion formula to work uh, directly in the non-perturbative theories. So in the, it has been worked out in the 3D easing and O2 models, but even though the formulas are different, it's, uh, the ideas are pretty similar. You consider different operators 
and you take them through the inversion formula. So you can consider some isolated operators in quite a systematic way. A little bit more work is needed to be done with these uh, spin fam uh, twist families, double twist operators. So perhaps one could try and do the same thing for the Liang theory in these intermediate dimensions. Uh, I'm not sure, it would be interesting to try. An issue with this is that you need quite high precision data of the involved operators, because this suppression here is no longer exact. So you need to be able to estimate the double discontinuity quite well. Okay, then there are kind of two issues that I uh, put under the rug a little bit. Uh, so one is the fact that we were surprisingly able to continue down to spin zero. And we don't really know why this works. Kind of the inversion formula works better than expected. I've been thinking a little bit like what would the alternative look like? Okay, we would need to look for solutions to crossing that are truncated in spin. And these have been worked out and some of these solutions, they're very hard to write down when the external operator goes down towards the unitarity bound, which is exactly what happens in the epsilon expansion. So, Still not clear really why it also seems to work also at finite epsilon. Sorry, I don't understand. What's the relation between L equals zero and crossing solutions truncated in spin? Oh, L equals zero is the problem we want to resolve. Yeah. Uh, then if you don't worry about the inversion formula, but just look for solutions to crossing where the CFT data is truncated in spin. That's, I mean, how the violation to analyticity in spin would look like. And people wrote down this some 10 years ago. So you can look at their explicit results and tune some parameters and see if you can actually write down such a solution for say these multi-critical so phi to the p theory. Well, almost completely gone in the hysteria now. Yeah, we've got more flowers than we've ever had on our so you, you, you are not prolific. muted. They're very dark. Since they haven't come out. You, you should mute yourself. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, we will discuss this. I'm, I'm just yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I follow. But okay. Take questions because I'm very happy to discuss this problem. Yeah. Same with this other problem that if you look at Simon Caronio's paper, he explicitly says that this is an inversion formula for unitary theories. However, now we manage to apply it to non-unitary theories, and if you look carefully, the thing that if I understood incorrectly, the thing that matter is not quite unitarity per se, but it's rather some regi limit that is guaranteed to hold in a unitary theory, but maybe it extends also to other classes of theories. Which is something to think of these things as, as open questions still. I don't have the answers to them, so I would be happy to discuss them. Okay, sorry for running a few minutes over time. Uh, and thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Johan, for this very nice uh, review. So we have a bit of time for questions. Johan, hi, I have a question. So, hi. yeah, thanks for the very clear, uh, clear uh, <laughs> uh, lecture. So, do you think that uh, higher order in epsilon, we just need to turn the crank? and we can go on, or at some point there is a sort of obstruction because you have infinite operators to play. Uh, I mean, there is a similar story with the Merlin bootstrap, no? so I want to wonder uh, if you believe here we can really systematically go on, or there is uh, such a... So, the way to answer this question is to really try and think in terms of this picture. And in order to, to start, attacking a specific theory with this, you need to look at the operator content. And how far you get depends on which theory you look at. So yeah, I demand five to the four. Let's take five yeah, to the so four. In let's five to the four that theory, equal to zero yeah. works. Uh, you can see we were able to epsilon to the four. At order epsilon to the five, there will be the same operators contributing as order epsilon to the four, but their contribution is more complicated. Then at epsilon to the six, you get a whole mess of operators. So in my opinion, I don't think you can extend this beyond epsilon to the five. Uh, 
if you knew everything about the theory, you could look at the inversion at epsilon to the six and see that it, it agrees in both sides if you want. But the predictive power is lost at some point because you, you need to put in more input than the output you get out. And at which order this thing happens depends on what theory you look at. And for the general fight to the P theory, I was only able to do this actually at leading order. So maybe we were lucky with fight to the four theory. Could you apply your ideas to, for instance, uh, QCD like theories near the bank Sachs fixed point where you expand in the, you know, how close you are to the um, free field limit, free field fixed point? Yeah, actually, there's something I was thinking about a couple of years ago. Uh, I think it would be very interesting. So I did one project where we looked at, you know, n equals four super young mills at weak coupling and correlators of bilinear scalars, which are the simplest, simplest operators that are gauge invariant. Mm -hmm. uh, like the example we had in mind was the Konigi operator. So already there, if you have a theory with scalars, you can in principle take our general result and see if you can match it with a correlator in, in bank sex some extended bank sacks where you have scalars. Mm -hmm. But in principle, the thing should work also if you have a theory with only fermions, but uh, you would need to crank the wheel a little bit. And we were not able to extend it beyond leading order in perturbation theory at weak coupling. Would the anomalous dimensions along the leading twist trajectory always fall off like one over L squared? Mm. This is a good question. Actually, the, the proper, the correct answer, and this is even a non-perturbative answer, says that in, again, d greater than two, gamma L always goes as minus a positive constant, C times A min over L to the tau min. So min here is the operator or min of the smallest twist in the theory. So either it's a scalar, because scalars have tau greater than or equal to d minus two over two, or it is a stress sensor, uh, which has twist d minus two. So, sorry, this is stress tensor. And this is scalar. So yeah, this is the general general uh, statement. And actually, since in principle we have all the machinery to prove this now, I, I added this as an exercise in in the notes I uploaded. And you can even compute this constant c. Hi, Johan. Uh, I have a simple question. Do you do you have a way to establish a connection with ordinary perturbation theory? Because in 5.4, I believe there, there, is, there resulted other epsilon to the fifth, right? For a oh, beta function, anomalous dimension, stuff like it's that. It's even better than that. Uh, the, uh, yeah, so these results. May, at some point, I read a statement uh, that these results are not guaranteed to be the same as in perturbation theory. They are. You always expect to get the same results out because there is, uh, I mean, there is, say, if this is dimension and this is some kind of coupling strange, you know, we're working in four minus epsilon dimensions, we're doing everything. There is the free theory and there is the interacting theory. We have just found that these are the only two options. If you're doing standard perturbation theory, you're, you're pretending that you're in a QFT somewhere along this line, then you flow to the, you compute the, the, the zero in the coupling in the beta function perturbatively. But in the end, you end up computing results at the fixed point. 
and these should agree with the conformal data, which is physical observables. And yeah, indeed, this has been computed. These two have even been computed to epsilon to the seven. Seven, uh, in, okay. In a not so well-known paper, actually, by uh, Oliver Schnetz, because they weren't included first, and then he included them in V2, and this, yeah. So it's a bit hard to find them. Uh, some other data have been computed to lower order. And in particular, what we managed to do was to compute uh, the central charges to epsilon to the four, and they were not computed to this order before. So in some cases, we have computed some new data that were not known before. But in the future, you could start the endeavor of computing these three diagrams if you want, and they should, should agree. But, but my, my question was more if there is a kind of a systematic uh, understanding of, of, of a relation between, I mean, you, you drew diagrams, right? And, and cut diagrams and stuff like that. Can, can you, is there a way to, to establish a, a stronger connection that just compare the results uh, between perturbation theory and, okay, you mean this diagram. and the inversion formula? This diagram. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of the purposes of doing this is we want to avoid computing the diagrams. But sure. as I did here, I'm kind of using the diagrams to get an insight in what operators I need to consider. So as I answered to Marco Serrano's question, one of the first things you need to you need to verify when you start attacking a new theory is, okay, which operators do I need to care about? And, well, I developed this kind of heuristic method, okay, okay. drawing some diagrams and cutting them through and then interpreting this as various operators contributing. You can also try and cut through here, say, and it would look like these operators by d to the L5. Okay. Maybe there are nicer, more explicit ways of connecting it to diagrams as well. Uh, Might be. <laughs> we can think about Maybe it. there's some work by David Meltzer, I think, which uh, is connected to this question. Yeah, on like conglomeration? No, that's another paper. Yes, maybe I'll put the reference later. Yeah, you can put the yeah put the reference and we can, we can see. Yeah, there were some papers called like conglomeration of operators, but I think these are a bit older by other authors. No, 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 no. These are those are that's an old paper. No, yeah. no, it's David Meltzer. It's uh, some dispersion for well. Uh, I'll, I'll I I'll, I'll find the, the yeah. You can put the reference in Slack and we can see what what there is to say about it. Yeah, Joan, let me just point out that you were uh, too kind in the sense that uh, Schnetz computed a few observable up to epsilon to the seven, while uh, you can manage to compute an entire family of anomalous dimension in one shot. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I know what is the order, but uh, probably it's not epsilon to the four for the entire family of the um, tracer symmetric operator. So, I mean, there, uh, is, a, there is a mileage here. Yeah. Because you, you, it's this not easy. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I, 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 these are known uh, to much less accuracy. No, no they, are, they are actually known to epsilon to the four also. They were before us, not the OP. Yeah, yeah but not epsilon to the seven, no, that's what. No, no, these to the seven, seven, there are a few. The four, and we just, we, yeah, we managed to touch upon the state of the art for these guys. Uh, right, yes. Yeah, I think Companiates and some other people computed them. Yeah. But I think there is a fundamental question here indeed is that, okay, if this is just a game which allows you to compute a few things up to a few more orders in EPSA and then it's bound to fail, then it's kind of very disappointing. Uh, and another thing is that indeed, so you kind of presented it, okay, here we notice that some things work for L equals zero, and so let's just like use this. But maybe it works for L equals zero for a few orders and it's gonna stop order or working. It. So what's going on? Like to my mind, what is missing here is what are the assumptions on the four point function of five, 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 five that you're actually using? 
because you're kind of starting from this inversion formula, which had some assumptions going into it, then throw in some more assumptions, then you throw in some observations. So in the end, the status of the results like you get is like take it or leave it, but you do not, it does not come with a kind of certificate. Okay, I'm 100% sure this is gonna work because of this and this. Like what is, for example, if this thing for L equals zero, this assumption that you made, suppose that you decided not to make this assumption, but to violate it. Yeah, you won't agree with perturbation theory, but what would go wrong at the level of the CFT? Do you know? Yeah, no, I, I agree with you that this is not the ultimate method that will solve all our problems, but perhaps one should take a slightly different approach and think of, of this as a way to explore what relations and assumptions you need to put in to, to find a certain CFT. So for instance, I think it's very interesting to compare what happens in the epsilon expansion with what happens at finite epsilon. No, but uh, uh, Jochen, we could go to phi epsilon, but I asked a concrete question. What would happen, what would go wrong in the CFT four-point function that you're studying if you did not make that assumption that you made? The assumption that I can continue down to epsilon equals zero. Yeah. Okay, I will get the exact same results up until the point where I try to solve for G. Okay. So I would, I would, uh, let's scroll back up. Yeah, I would, I would end up here and okay. there would be nothing more to do. So, okay, so now you have a one parameter family of CFT four point functions with this three parameter G. And you are saying that they'll satisfy all your assumptions and just one of them agrees with perturbation theory and others don't. But yeah. there has to be something like purely from the CFT point of view, there has to be something special about the four point function, which is the true one. What is it? Yeah, and maybe, maybe the thing is that you can continue down to spin zero. I don't have the answer to this. This is an observation yeah. we've made. Uh, yeah, but, but until this is resolved, already, this is whole thing is in the air. I mean, already this is telling you something. Already this is telling you that all data for all spinning operators at all leading order is given in terms of just one parameter. So yeah, fine. Okay. Only somehow it's understanding about the organization of data in a in a conformal field theory. I think it's an interesting result because if you just look in the in the general textbook higher dimensional formal field theory, they say there is in principle no structure at all. All operators could could float around and have exactly whatever CFT data they want. And now from a few assumptions, yes, there are assumptions that go into deriving this. Uh, but with these assumptions, you can already parameterize data for an infinite tower operators in, in just one parameter. Okay, you found this observation, but now we can either say, okay, great, congratulate you, Johan, you found this nice observation, or actually you discovered a machine that we should go and start using to do other things. But in order to do this, we have to be 100% sure that the machine gives the right answers. Suppose you tell us that like in the third order in epsilon, you actually have to add some correction to this uh, relation that you found. Uh -huh. I mean, that is just the whole game becomes very non-constraining. And then yeah, I just prefer maybe... to work very hard and compute diagrams, but diagrams are guaranteed to give correct answers. Slava, but now maybe you're, I mean, Joanne wanted to present in this way, but you can even say, okay, uh, G is a free parameter, then let, let me use some other input. Let's say perturbation theory where gamma phi is known very well, and that's it. He could use an extender without having this assumption of the scalar operator, which is in fact an hypothesis that he cannot test. He could have presented by saying, I mean, I, I cannot fix uh, G, or maybe there is some other safety way, I agree, to fix it. And this is fixed by something else let's say matching with perturbation theory. Yet he can go on systematically until at least epsilon to the four. That will be clean. What's, okay. what, what's, no? 
no 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 that's that's yeah that's that's the way to proceed yeah, i agree so, yeah, yeah it's not uh, I mean, this is this this should be seen as just one toolbox you can have, one item in the toolbox you can have, and if you want to think about it a bit more stringent, there are two two possible applications of this tool already in the Epsom expansion. One is to try and really think carefully about what assumptions you need to make to single out a certain theory, etc. And yes you're not going to get very far, but at least you can come to this point. Or you can use this as a way to compute new things. And then as Marco said, you're free to perhaps borrow some information to the literature in order to find some new data. I'm sorry, this is called turn the crank. I mean, first you have to understand why this works and then turn the crank, not the other way around. I, I, I disagree that that's the right way to proceed. Well, so, so, no, but you can, you can, pro okay, are you, <laughs> are, you, are you happy with why it works up to this point? Not sure, because, because you present a bit like a, like a magic box. We start with some uh, formula, which is, has been, which has been justified, quote unquote, in some non-perturbative situation, but even that justification is very questionable. Now we are going to take this using perturbation theory go through some steps which are unclear and lo, lo and behold, it produces the right answers in the situations where it has been checked. Now take it and run with it and play with it and produce more and more data. Yeah, you can generate new papers like that and maybe it's great, but wouldn't it be more satisfactory to clarify the underlying assumptions of this whole game first? Oh, I would, I, I would like to do that. I mean, I think we can think about more things. You know, I, I, yeah. I put this these uh, two comments here because I don't know the complete answer to them. So I would be happy to continue discussing them, uh, you know. Mm. Hopefully we can, even if you in the audience have some input, you can write it in Slack and we can think about it. I think, uh, yeah, Slava, you're demanding uh, a lot, but it's an important point. Here we are just finding some solutions to, to the crossing equation. I think your, your question could be reformulated. Suppose that we do bootstrap, like the, the numerical bootstrap with many, many, many derivatives in 3.99 dimensions, in D equals 3.99, then we will see a family of solutions which goes between the free theory and the, the kink, which is easing. And this family of solutions you know, they're allowed by the bootstrap equation. So I think that family of solutions, that line of solutions would correspond to varying this parameter G. So the question is that you're asking is how would we, how, what would specify that the kink is a special point and that the kink corresponds to the Wilson Fisher fixed point? How do we determine that this is the correct uh, theory? And between the uh, G so is no, like the outside answer. you are allowed to reach. Just to right. lower, if you tune G, it's lying outside the allowed region until you, you get to the to easing. I, I think probably no. This is at the boundary of the allowed region, right? There's a line. No, it's outside the you show the formula. I mean it's the at the free theory, the slope is vertical. Of course, gamma phi goes like G square and gamma. Phi squared goes like G. But that's at exactly D equals four. No, the two leading order there, yeah, one is one on the list dimension is, is the square of the other. But you and you can do uh, well, I mean, any, I mean any the solution the solution that comes out of the bootstrap has to be described by these equations, right? No, not necessarily, because in the bootstrap, we don't impose, uh, there are some assumptions which go into the Lorentzian inversion formula, which may or may not be satisfied by some numerical bootstrap solution, yeah. well, so maybe. One assumption that I used was that the spectrum, when you go to four dimensions, reduces to the free, free theory in four dimensions. 
Then I worked. Yes, yeah, so you're not adding, you're not adding any new states. Sorry, you are not adding new states. I'm not adding new states compared to the free theory. I add yeah. the possibility that operators that have zero OP coefficients in the free theory would now start to couple in the interacting theory. Sure. Then, thanks to this extra sine square factor, you can ignore almost all of them. But yeah, there could be, in principle, a generic operator appearing, which does not sit in the free theory that just pops up. And then, yeah, you need to deal with it. So yeah, there are some assumptions there. And if you want, I can try and make them more clear also on, on Slack. Uh, I mean, I only had one hour now, so I had to be a bit schematic. Yeah, you can do the ON model for any N, right? In epsilon expansion, yes. I mean, you're not using uh, the, the positivity which goes into the standard bootstrap, which is a, also one of the main problems of the standard bootstrap because, I mean, it, it restricts away from many of the systems we're interested in. Yeah, so, I mean, in the same way as you can do diagram for any N, we can do this for any N. So for instance, the self-avoiding polymer in three dimensions, what would you say about that? Just n equals zero. You had, uh, so the nice thing why they could do this numerical thing here is that uh, they knew a lot of high precision data to put in as input. I think if you knew at least part of, of, of the corresponding data to some quite high precision, probably you should be able to do self-avoiding walks also in 3D. Then again, I don't completely understand the full implications of, of unitarity in the derivation of the inversion formula. If there's something more than just a regular limit involved, uh, I tried to read the paper, but uh, uh, also, I am struggling with this paper. It's a difficult paper. We can do the Epsilon expansion without ever referring to either Regi or unitarity. So there must be some. Uh... Yeah, in the Epsilon expansion, it's fine. Then you can just repeat what I, I uh, the story I told. But maybe for the 3D theory, it would be more interesting to do the inversion formula numerically. And, then, yeah, I can't guarantee that it's going to work, but my suspicion is it will work quite similar to the easing and O2 case. I can give you some data on what we know about the theory. Ah, yeah, no, that would right. be interesting. Yeah. Joan, sorry, coming back to this fixing of G, no? Uh, would it work to consider, I don't know, another correlator, phi square over a uh, four point function with phi square? And maybe this is going to, to give you some consistency condition that fix you for your G. I mean, I agree with Slava that the way of presenting that uh, you need to push uh, the Lorentzian inversion formula into a regime which uh, typically, I mean, you can't, uh, it's not, uh, I wouldn't say it's the best way to, to present it, right? Because th this is a one condition that you might imagine to fix in many ways in principle. Last yeah. but not least, in fact, perturbation theory itself, but within the bootstrap, for instance, some mm -hmm. other consistency condition should be there. Yeah, maybe there is, uh, maybe, yeah, we, we actually started to, to look at, at systems of, of correlators in, in, say, the easing or ON model in the epsilon expansion. Of course, well, first we need to, to work out, work it out, but then, yes, we should be able to play with what assumptions we really need to put in. And maybe if you consider the whole system of correlators, you will be able to, to fix this in another way. Uh, yeah, we'll see what happens. Okay. Thanks. I mean, in your approach, everything seemed to be very rational in terms of rational numbers. Uh, I mean, but of course, at higher orders, you get various irrational numbers, z to three and so on, cropping up. I mean, uh, how would they pop up in your formalism potentially? Uh, so uh, let's go up here. 
So one of the things that happens when you're beyond the order I presented is that you need to, you, you need to start evaluating these conformal blocks. Also the corrections to them, you have some dimensional corrections to them, etc. And in the end, when you start say derivative of the conformal block with respect to space time dimension, at some point you start to generate more complicated functions like polylogs and, and, and the polylogs are naturally connected to the uh, zeta numbers. And the same thing, higher order, you need to consider a sum of operators before you compute the doubling's continuity. And also sum of conformal blocks with complicated OP coefficients can again produce this complicated. Uh, and at what order do you get significant mixing problems? Oh, mixing is another issue I have not talked about. So there are two places mixing goes into this. One is when in, in the cross channel, one is potential mixing for the data that you, you want to find. So let's start first with the left hand side here. In the, in the easing mobile, the leading twist family, the double twist operators, there is no mixing involved. So you know that the data you extract is guaranteed to, to be the data of that one operator at each bin. Otherwise, if there was mixing, you would get some weighted averages. So instead of AL, it would be you know, some I, A, L, comma, I, some N, L. Now, here, if there is mixing of the operators you need to consider in cross channel, and this actually happens at epsilon to the four, uh, you need to take that into account when you compute this uh, this sum, and each each term one by one has its own anomalous. This will extract for you this anomalous dimension square over eight that we had. So you need to do this term for each operator one by one. So yeah, it does get quite complicated with mixing. We understand how to do it in principle, but of course in practice it's it's difficult. Yeah, yeah, can I ask something? So if I remember correctly in your paper, the original paper, you okay. didn't really solve the mixing, right? So you made some kind of answers for this continuity. So is there now some new technique that is more systematic or yeah, we have the we have the we have the problem of mixing here, right? And and you're right, we did some kind of answers to compute the sum over the mixing terms. Again, probably Slava would, would be skeptical about this ansatz. It was based on some general principles in terms of transcendentality. Again, these transcendental numbers appearing. It couldn't be too complicated because we assume that at certain order in perturbation theory, only a certain number of transcendental functions can appear. Oh. There is an important application which you can do with the inversion formula, you can do it with other equivalent methods, which I haven't talked about today, which is the uh, n equals four super young Mills strong coupling, where you can compute corrections in the supergravity or string theory uh, from, from the a CFT computation. And then again, you need to consider mixing. And the way they resolved mixing there was that they considered systems of mixed correlators at lower order, and those they just needed to get from other methods. So it wasn't a purely bootstrap computation. And then they managed to resolve the mixing and given N equals four super young mills was a sufficiently well-behaved theory, they managed to do that and then they could just explicitly do the sum also over mixed operators. So yeah, unfortunately it, it's a bit of a case by case. I see, thanks.
we're well over time now, so maybe we should allow no, people. No, but that, I mean, we are still in the discussion. If they want to leave, but we, uh, I would be very yeah. happy to continue the discussion. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering if there is any way, so as you say, it's a very, it's a very simple minded suggestion. Uh, so as you say, the crucial, I mean, the restriction on spin is zero comes uh, in parochial derivation uh, from the Reggie limit and uh, so some integrals don't converge for spin equals zero while they converge for high spin. So could you, for example, I mean, it would be a worthwhile check, it seems, to show that in phi to the fourth theory, the asymptotics of these integrals are actually expected to be better so that you can, the integrals that for current theory, which was a general safety argument, they were expected to converge only for L larger than one. Actually for you, they converge all the way to L equals zero because of some improved asymptotics, which you can again verify or kind of justify in perturbation theory. Um, so what I can say is that actually maybe we can't hope that improved Reggie behavior will save us because actually, oh, actually the, the result of the inversion formula as a function of spin, you know, is this, is this function, it's a uh, negative, you know, you can push the boundary towards down, you know, spin four, it is the unitarity bound here is spin two, but actually you do reach a pole before you hit spin zero. So this is already working in the analytic continuation of, of, of the result beyond the pole. So, but in general, I mean, this pole business. Yeah, I understand what you mean, but, but okay. But of course, to get to the physical spectrum from the imaginary, okay, now the discussion is going to get technical. Yeah. That from the, so the original formula is supposed to converge for complex dimension values, but of course for complex dimension values, there are no poles. And so the spectrum is not there. The spectrum is in the real, uh, on the real line. And to get to the real line from complex values, you already have to go through an infinite series of poles, well, finite uh, series of poles uh, where the formula stops converging. So, okay, here you have yet another pole through which you have to get through. Only that this pole now sits on the real axis. But somehow you should be able, so for example, one hope would be, it's very hard to justify the inversion formula in, in strongly coupled CFTs. In fact, I think the justification exists in the literature are completely non-rigorous. And I mean, there are some claims going around which have not been proved at all. We don't know if there are rigid trajectories in real theories, or maybe there's some point that we can reject cuts. So you're talking uh, non-perturbative, strongly yeah. coupled. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's kind of, one could hope that perhaps since you're working in perturbative theories, one could hope that you should be able to give a completely independent proof of the inversion formula, or maybe not independent based on the same ideas, but a much more solid proof of the inversion formula in the perturbative theories. Mm -hmm. So that you would not have to rely on this non-perturbative argument, which is questionable in several aspects, but you could give like a super duper rigorous perturbative argument in perturbative context. And that, that argument would also explain while you are allowed to use in perturbative constant, this, this, this uh, formula also for phi down to spin equals zero. Mm. Yeah, that would be nice. 
this uh, admittedly I, I'm not an expert on 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 the regge theory and the regge limit of correlators uh, but it certainly would be one way of, of, of investigating what happens then is the question is within the space of perturbative CFTs if now the phi4 theory is particularly nice or not uh, well I mean we know that in perturbative diagrams you just had some extra logs and you just have to show that in every order of perturbation theory uh, so this regi behavior is just to close the contour. I mean, it's regi, regi, but in fact, it's just to close the contour, push it to infinity. So in perturbation theory, order by order, you just get some extra logs. So if you could push the contour to infinity for the free correlator, presumably in every other perturbation theory, you can still push the contour to infinity and, and prove what you need. Yeah, if you if you have some, you know, power plus epsilon. So any extra logs would still decay, yeah. Yeah, so it is conceivable that actually you could get a much nicer proof in perturbation theory. Yeah. Then the, the, there is something subtle going on here because the continuation to spin zero wasn't even, if you just look at the data for the operators, you know, phi square, t mu nu, whatever the next one is called, phi d l4, d4, uh, phi. If you just look at this data, you didn't know anything about the business of continuation to spin zero. You would know, you know, find epsilon three here, you would find zero here, and you would find this is something epsilon square, next something epsilon square. So even if you didn't know anything about spin zero, you would say, okay, there is a truncated solution that spin zero. And this is exactly what I mentioned about these truncated solutions by Hemskerk et al. That exactly in 4D, you can find such a truncated solution near the free theory. So. No, but but you have to use the input from perturbation theory somewhere. So I was just saying, yeah, there is this truncated solution for yeah. sure. And but somehow non-perturbatively it vanishes. It it's not that it vanishes, it just doesn't contribute to this uh, phi to the fourth. Well, non-perturbability it organizes into the same function as these other guys. I see. But it's only when you do this funny analytic continuation to spin zero and promote the spin to the conformal spin. Yeah, well, it's... Um... Yeah, admittedly, we, we, we don't really understand what, what's going on. But does the correlator allow an expansion in epsilon? Yeah, I know that at finite z z bar, the correlator probably allows no correlator. Correlator admits an expansion in epsilon. You can do it for small z z bar during the conformal block decomposition, etc. You're gonna find this data. Actually, it was some Anias and Bisi and Paria Day. Maybe someone else yeah. wrote down this at order epsilon. The complete correlator. Okay, but somehow when you go to this double light cone limit, uh, something happens because some powers of epsilon uh, you know the, 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 the also the conformal blocks they behave singularly in the limit when gamma phi goes to zero at least some conformal blocks i think right uh, it happens at least for the conformal block yes yeah yeah so conformal block of phi squared when it appears in the op of phi times phi is singular in the limit when gamma phi goes to zero. There are things like that happening, yeah. So, so this this could also be done even in you can see this effect even in uh, in Euclidean space, because when phi is a free theory, when phi is a free field, we know that it cannot couple to phi squared. No, I mean, to, to, it can only couple to phi squared, which has dimension exactly twice gamma phi twice phi is a free no it does no it does 
some of the things you are saying I've only seen in the in the mixed correlator blocks. I'm not sure if we're talking about the same things. But here, it, here, here you can see why, why one order in epsilon disappears. Right? You have g squared on top, but then you put in something that's order epsilon in the bottom here. Yeah, but yeah, I see that it disappears, but what is the physical effect which is responsible for this disappearance? Yeah, and, and my, you know, my answer just based on observation is that there seems to be a non perturbative thing going on that wants to put in phi square in the family of the twin in the spinning guys. Well, there is another simpler explanation for this phenomenon. It just says that if uh, phi uh, is a free field, if the dimension of phi is zero, then uh, If the dimension of phi is zero, then there has to be something which will prevent phi squared from getting anomalous dimension at all. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I, I have some notes on that. I'll maybe we should indeed move the discussion to Slack about this particular point. But if there is any other point, uh, I yeah. We should continue discussing this. And I mean, if you have some ideas on how to resolve these questions. Uh... Uh, no, I don't really have any ideas. I have some other things I thought about, which probably are tangential. Any other questions? Perhaps a very general question. In quantum field theory, you can work out the higher order behaviors of the perturbative expansion using uh, instant on type methods and it was done some time ago. And this translates into something to do with the epsilon expansion. Is there any hope that you could do anything like that within a bootstrap framework? I, there, there was, a paper by I think Klebanov and Jombi that looked at instantons. So there is the extension of the ON model from large M, and then you can go to well, they showed that the phi q behavior epsilon. developed in imaginary terms of result you know, corresponding to some kind of decay. Yeah, so they looked at instantons there. Maybe I mean we know the epsilon expansion is uh, is an asymptotic series. So something must be there to, to save it, to make it finite at, at finite epsilon. Well, I, when you use resummation techniques, you feed in some information about the high order behavior of the series in order to mm -hmm. get results. Yeah, I've never done any of these resummation techniques apart from very naive Paddy approximations, so. Yeah, maybe someone else in the audience knows. Joan, I try to, if I understand Hugo's question, I try to reformulate. So Hugo was saying, you correct me if I'm wrong, that it is known that the, by some arguments, uh, the large order behavior of asymptotic series, you can argue from some instant on computation, which is not very rigorous, but there are some way to, to argue what is the large order behavior of the epsilon expansion, for instance. And, uh, and then he was wondering whether you can get these results from your, your technique. Uh, you, is this, uh, am I interpreting correctly your question? Yeah, that's more or less true. I mean, uh, I think it goes back to the 1970s, these methods of working That's out. right, yeah. This is, uh, back, it goes back to the, to the 70s, yeah. yeah. Okay, I, I have hard to see how they would naively just pop out of something you could do. But maybe when this is what I was wanting to say, maybe you can look, say, within an instant on sector and then within that sector try to relate. Say you assume that each operator gets its own, you know, instant on contribution to its data. But actually, maybe in the same way as we related several pieces of data here, maybe you can do the same on the level of these instantons. 
but I have hard to see how you would kind of discover this instanton or instanton like contributions. Well, I think it relates to finding out the discontinuity along the tip of the cut in the complex conjugate com constant complex coupling constant. Uh huh. Yeah. They and this comes from a subtle point. I mean, it's not very difficult. I can include this in my presentation tomorrow. Uh -huh. But yeah, I, I I don't really understand what what what's the goal. Is it to to understand these insatom contributions better, or from a different perspective, or? Well, in some sense, the bootstrap replaces the comp standard perturbative method. So whatever you can derive within these sort of old fashioned methods, you'd hope to re-derive within a more bootstrap type framework. I see. And in fact, at least for the non-perturbative 3D easing, people say that whatever they get using inversion formula contains some non-perturbative effects which improve the, the numerical agreement between the inversion formula results and the numerical bootstrap results. So it's a it's a valid question if in this perturbative constant there are also context there are also some non-perturbative corrections, whatever they mean. I think what they mean, what you mean by that, Slava, is that in for instance the easing model, you can either use the inversion formula or the old machinery to compute an expansion in one over spin. And then you can see what function that corresponds to. And then you can compare that with the exact result from the inversion formula. And typically you get two terms in the exact result. And one of them agrees with the perturbations in large spin. And the other part is, you know, exponentially suppressed at large spin. So you never see it, but it does become important at finite spin. Now, I think the analysis they made, this was a paper by Sonner Albayre, David Polan, David Meltzer, maybe. I don't remember all the authors. I think they analyzed this numerically, but also in a more abstract setting, not specified to a particular theory. I'm not sure if you would see the same thing in the epsilon expansion. paper it boils down to just I mean when you do this perturbative inversion formula you expand in z and I think what they try to argue is that expanding in z and integrating is not equivalent to to doing the full integral like non-perturbative integral so, so, and I guess expanding in z is something that you are doing here so, so potentially you are missing some okay some maybe, of this. maybe I've misunderstood their papers so. though no, I, th I think probably we are saying the same, but yeah. Yeah, there is this proof of the perturbative inversion formula, which I talked about, which is something that really relies on you being in perturbation theory. And the, 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 then in the same way, you can start from the general formula and derive the thing they use in these numerical computations, but I'm not sure exactly how rigorous that is, but it might not be need to be 100% rigorous either because they anyway have to do approximations when they decide which operators to put in, so. John, let me, maybe this is again a your question in another formulation. So in, the, in quantum field theory, we understand more or less why perturbative, perturbative expansions are asymptotic because you, are, you have a finite object and you are expanding at, at a singularity and then the expansion cannot be analytic and convergent. So this goes back to Dyson in the 50s and we have an understanding from, from, an, from an Lagrangian description. For instance, in the epsilon expansion, naively, 
the, for small epsilon, epsilon expansion is like the coupling expansion, which is also the H bar expansion. And generically, the X bar expansion is uh, asymptotic. Okay, yeah. modulo integrable theories and few other exceptions, it's just asymptotic. Now, the question is from your point of view, you don't have a Lagrangian descriptor, you have nothing of this sort. At the end, however, you reproduce the coefficient of the epsilon expansion. So, in some, somewhere in your computation, you are doing uh, what uh, Alex was saying some sort of uh, irregular, uh, some mistake, so to say, inverting. Typically, you get this asymptotic formula when you, when you have a, not a uniformly convergent sum and you put out, uh, you exchange sums and integrals, you do things like this. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, a well-defined quantity becomes asymptotic. So the question is, in some sense, if you can pinpoint where uh, Okay, the one thing is, that I did, which I didn't quite say, I said that Z much, much smaller than one, right? But I've also actually secretly assumed that epsilon is even smaller. So I never probe properly the region where you allow these to be comparable. So maybe that is, if you, if you, try to properly analyze this, making this comparable, maybe that's where you would, would start to be able to resolve these, these issues. So guys, shall let, guys and girls, shall we let, um, Johan rest because he worked very hard. I should see what's in the chat. Uh, maybe there were some useful. Okay, yeah, you can, you guys can leave. I will just copy the chat to see if it's uh, if it's uh, something I should think more about. You should copy the chat before we close the meeting. Yeah, exactly. That's what I wanted to do. Actually, you should stop the recording because you are. Oh, is the recording still going on? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Maybe those who upload it can can 